right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started with our, our second speaker's talk. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Nathan Fox. Dr. Fox is a distinguished university professor in the Department of Human Development at the University of Maryland, College Park. He is past editor of the journal Infant Behavior uh, and Development and past editor of the journals Developmental Psychology and Psychophysiology, past pre president of Division 7 of the American Psychological Association, which is the developmental division, um, and the International Society for Infant Studies. He is a re recent recipient of the NIH Merit Award for Research Excellence, as well as the recipient of numerous other federal grants. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Psychological Society. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nathan Fox. Thank you. Uh, let me, uh, can everybody hear me okay? So um, let me first uh, start by thanking Heidi for organizing uh, this symposium, which um, I think is an uh, excellent symposium. Uh, I was hoping to be joined by my colleague Ken Rubin, but uh, unfortunately he's not here, so I'm going to be representing the University of Maryland. Although I feel um, close ties to uh, University of North Carolina, Greensboro, since um, one of your professors, uh, Susan Calkins, was a postdoc with me, and currently uh, Kate Degnan is a research assistant professor in my laboratory. So um, there are a lot of connections that I have, plus George Michel, wherever he is, if he's still here. Uh, there he is, uh, as an old friend from the uh, International Society of Infant Studies. So um, I really uh, do appreciate the invitation. Okay. So, I thought I'd start out with a picture, since Ron, um, Ron has pictures. Um, uh, this is actually not from Maryland or Australia. Um, it's, uh, I, uh, um, I went with a friend of mine, we went hiking in the high Sierras of Yosemite uh, this past summer, and this is uh, one of the uh, camps up at 12,000 feet, it's called Vogelstang. Um, and it's just absolutely beautiful. And for those of us who no longer wish to carry 170 po 70 pound backpacks, you can hike from camp to camp and they give you dinner and breakfast and a place to sleep. So it's really quite wonderful. Um, but I thought just to, sh you know, as pictures are, uh, Ron showed you those wonderful pictures, so I thought I would uh, try that as well. So um, I'm going to, Actually, I really do appreciate Ron's wonderful talk. Um, uh, it really was uh, thought-provoking, and um, uh, from the conversation and the questions afterwards, it was clear that it generated uh, quite a bit of interest. And I'm not going to say that I'm going to answer the questions, but I am going to try to address some of the issues that uh, Ron raised in his uh, remarks. All right, so um, what I, uh, I'm going to take a little bit of an opposite tack. Um, I'm going to raise what I think are problems that uh, psychiatry, whether it be child psychiatry um, or general psychiatry um, and developmental psych psychopathology have in trying to understand anxiety um, as well as temperament. Um, and so the first is, how do we account for both the continuity and discontinuity of a disorder over time? So Ron talked a little bit about uh, the cross-time correlations between, uh, for anxiety disorders. Um, and one of the questions, and uh, what was obvious from the slide that he presented, is that there wasn't great uh, uh, continuity of anxiety disorders. Perhaps later on um, in, uh, in adults there was, but at least not, uh, the evidence is not in children. And I'll show you some of that evidence in just a second. The second question, which um, Ron also dealt with, um, was uh, really the, in terms of his uh, thinking about the relation between temperament and uh, disorder um, really has the underlying theme of how can we uh, account for the emergence uh, of the disorder in children. Um, these are some data from uh, my colleague Danny Pine who is at the NIH 
and it looks at the continuity of uh, adolescent anxiety disorder and any mood and anxiety disorder uh, in adults. And um, the point uh, uh, really to emphasize here is uh, if you look at those individuals who were diagnosed with the disorder, an anxiety disorder, any anxiety disorder as adolescents, um, but who uh, maintained that diagnosis as adults, uh, either with a mood or anxiety disorder, um, and that's that lower column there, what you can see is it's not, not, not that many. So of the 253 uh, in that row, only 62 uh, maintained uh, their, that uh, diagnosis of a disorder uh, over that period of time. Um, in our own work, um, and this is um, a paper that was just uh, accepted with uh, Andrea Cronus, who's a colleague of mine in the uh, psychology department, um, taking the lead on this paper. Um, we've looked at the um, ability to predict from stable behavioral inhibition or temperament during infancy and childhood. And now this is maternal report of uh, behavioral inhibition over time. Um, and uh, looking at the prediction to uh, anxiety disorders or any diagnosis uh, in late uh, or middle adolescence. And what you can see here is, is there a pointer? I guess not. All right. So if what you can see here is that um, the high behaviorally inhibited uh, subjects have a, a much higher uh, percent uh, incidence of disorder, any lifetime disorder, specifically anxiety and also specifically uh, social anxiety compared to low behaviorally inhibited kids. And uh, if you uh, want to get away for a second from the issue of diagnosis, but just look at symptoms, um, and you use a, uh, a report measure called a SCARED, whether it be uh, self-report by the adolescent themselves or parent report uh, on the same measure, what you can see is you find the same relation between the stability of temperament uh, over infancy and early childhood with high behaviorally inhibited uh, individuals uh, both self-reporting and being reported by parents as uh, more symptoms uh, uh, on this particular measure of social anxiety. So um, the problem is, as I said, facing, uh, facing us is to try and understand um, how we can account for the emergence of disorder amongst behaviorally inhibited children and uh, also how can we account for continuity or discontinuity over time. I should add that in our own work, um, if you look at it, uh, roughly around 50% of behaviorally inhibited children maintain that um, characteristic over time. Um, I know that uh, in that one slide from Jerry Kagan's uh, study, um, Ron showed that it was around 25%, but that was only through age seven. I'm now talking about up through age uh, 14 or 15. But that means that 50% or half of the children who have uh, been identified with behavioral inhibition no longer uh, appear to be behaviorally inhibited um, as adolescents. So the question is, what, what's accounting for this continuity or discontinuity? over time. Well, let me, um, uh, since Ron uh, brought up the uh, uh, concept of behavioral inhibition, let me review for you, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, it was a term that was first um, described or a um, type of child that was first described by Jerry Kagan in 1984 in a paper in Child Development. Um, uh, behaviorally inhibited children are considered to be those children who are quiet and watchful, that when they are confronted with novelty, particularly social novelty, they stop doing what they're doing, they retreat from unfamiliarity, and they refuse to uh, usually engage in interaction. And I, um, 
in our work over the last uh, 15 or so years, these are the kinds of things that we have described for behaviorally inhibited children. They report low self-esteem um, and poor peer relationships. They often report, particularly in middle childhood, that they are the victims of bullying. And in, physiologically, um, they have elevated morning cortisol, enhanced autonomic reactivity, enhanced startle responses, and a pattern of uh, frontal EEG asymmetry, which is associated with the experience and expression of dysphoric affect.